This is an Eye on Annapolis special update. I've never done an interview on the tail end of a Drake tail. Is it a Drake tail? Yeah, it's a Drake tail. Yeah, uh, right here in, uh, in downtown Eastport. This is great. We're at the Annapolis Maritime Museum again, and we are talking with Dave Gindel, who is a published author now, which is kind of exciting, uh, Lifetime Annapolitan, and your new book, The Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse, uh, a Chesapeake Bay icon, is just being released right now. October 12th is the release date where it is available. And this is a book that's needed to be written for years. I wanted to talk to you a bit about it and about you. Yeah, great. Thanks. It's a, it's a beautiful day and great to spend a little bit of time with you and your listeners here. Uh, yeah, you know, th- this book, I've had it in my mind for, for 10 or 15 years. You know, somebody should do a book about that. And, uh, you know, and, and finally, last summer, it um, it bubbled back up again on my list of uh, of projects, and did a little survey of the world, and realized, you know, no one's ever written a book about the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse. It's it's in a number of books. It's in some beautiful you know, books. That, no that book blows my mind. Okay, because if I sit there, I mean, to borrow a, a tagline off of your book, but if I go to anybody that has any familiarity with the Chesapeake Bay or Maryland, and you say, name an icon, okay, it's one of two things. It's either the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse or it's the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's it. I mean, the, the Capitol Dome falls in maybe fifth, sixth, seventh place or something like that. So that blows my mind that there's never been a book on it. Yeah, it, it's, it was pretty amazing to me as well. Uh, you know, 1875, and there was plenty of history there on the Shoal and on the Point even even before that. So, uh, yeah, so so I, I made sure that, that no one else had done this before. And, um, you know, I, I looked at my own bookshelves and, and found half a dozen books that write about it beautifully and, and have some beautiful photographs of it in there, lighthouse books. Um, but, you know, never uh, never a book solely devoted to it. So uh, so it was time. So uh, at that point, I went into action. Well, let's talk about your background. You're a, life, you're a lifer here. And That's you right. um, Actually, you're not a published author now, like this is the first time. I mean, because you were one of the founders of Spin Sheet and Prop Talk. Yeah. 25 years ago? 25 years ago, yeah. Man, so you're old. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting there, right? Um, I was 12 when we... No, okay, uh, there you go. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I grew up um, in Annapolis, uh, went to St. Mary's um, Elementary School and, and St. Mary's High School and, uh, you know, learned to sail here. And when I was 16, I, I started working right across the creek teaching sailing at the Annapolis Sailing School in the, uh, in the glory days over there. Uh, you know, there were 30 rainbows out every weekend and I was one of the instructors there. You know, got my captain's license when I was 19 back in the uh, late 80s and, um, you know, stuck around the boats and the boat world, uh, you know, for years, uh, just delivering boats, working on race boats, um, you know, kind of in the in the world. Drove the water taxis one summer, you know, which was right. great. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in, in 1995, uh, my partner, uh, Mary Eiliff, who's now Mary Ewinson, uh, we started Spin Sheet Magazine. Yeah, did the first, uh, the first issue on uh, My Kitchen Table. And uh, she sold the ads, and we, uh, you know, we got together and made this thing. So uh, yeah, I've been around, and uh, you know, still still going hard on the boats and with the uh, with the writing. Spin sheet and prop talk. They're twenty five years now. Or, or spin, spin sheet's twenty five. Yeah, it was the summer of ninety five that we started that. We were both in our in our mid twenties. Um, and then Prop Talk, we started ten years later. So that's having its fifteenth okay. anniversary this year. So we've got the double going on. Got, yeah, got got some things. Well, there are lots of big anniversaries too. I mean, the boat show would have. If would have could have they would have had a big anniversary this year as well and um, it's just a shame that we're living in a it is it, world. it is it's amazing you know I I had left the magazines back at the end of 2007 you know Mary uh, Mary bought out my half and I and I stepped away from the day to day and Molly Winans came in and uh, took over uh, you know my role as the editor of Spin Sheet and Mary became the sole proprietor and I'm you know. I'm so amazed at, at, at what they've been able to do, you know, and, and, and I've actually been gone longer than I was there, which is which is amazing to to think about. And I'm so proud of them. And, you know, this fall with the 25th anniversary, the 15th anniversary, the boat show anniversary, the book coming out, you know, I was really looking forward to the fall of 2020, October specifically, uh, with all these events. And, and you know, and here we are, uh, you know, virtual yeah. and you and I standing 10 feet apart from each other talking. It's, it's not not a not a good year. Let's bring on 2021. But Let's talk about the Thomas Point Show Lighthouse book. Um, you know, this, you know, why, okay, it obviously has not been written about, and that mm-hmm. was just sort of like, hey, it needs to be. But, I mean, was this something that, you, in your youth, I mean, you said you grew up on the water and everything else. Did it, was there an attraction there or just because? You know, that's a great question. I, I, like everyone that sails and is on the water around here, I love the thing. You know, we, we kind of took it for granted for years when we were when we were younger. You Everybody know, takes everywhere they granted. are for granted. I mean, you don't realize it's how just cool the last, of a town we It's just the last, what's great is, you know, uh, the last couple of years, 
it feels like Thomas Point Lighthouse, is, everybody's sort of recognizing how amazing it is, and there's been fundraisers and events, and John Potvin and his crew have done an amazing job out there um, uh, preserving it. But so growing up, you know, we sailed by it. I remember uh, going by with my parents and my brothers, and, and the keepers would be there, and they'd come out and wave at us we, when we sailed by. And, uh, you know, th- that was kind of cool, but it was, it, was, it was just there, right? It wasn't anything um, celebrated the way it's been the last, the last few years. And you know, how I came to be the one to write about it, it's a real honor to be the one that was that's getting a chance to write this story. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I saw the opportunity there and, and said, somebody's got to tell this story. Right. So I started digging in a bit, um, looking at some of the uh, uh, the archives. I went over to um, the National Archives in College Park. Uh, the other National Archives in downtown D.C., State Archives out on Raoul Boulevard, and just started sucking in all the information I could about the Shoal and the Lighthouse and the lighthouses that were there beforehand. And, and I realized, you know, there's a lot of rich material here. This is not just, a, you know, a story about what's happening out there now. You know, th- there's some great, uh, colorful you know, meaningful stories going back uh, into the 18th century uh, that happened there. So, uh, so, so I really dove in. Begs the question. I mean, how did you? I mean, you said you went to the National Archives. I mean, this stuff didn't just jump out at you. I mean, how long did this take you? And how does one go about researching a a building that yeah. is, you know, hundreds of years old? Well, all right. So, great question. So, uh, you know, I, I always have a number of writing projects going on. You know, nonfiction <laughs> history writing projects, and have you know as long as I can remember and. In the spin sheet days, when I was there day to day, it was great because every winter, you know, during the winter lull, I would go and chase down some historic story, you know, the Schooner America or, or the Alden Schooners up in New England, um, you know. And, and so I got pretty good at researching and, and, and storytelling and, and, you know, realized how to uh, how to do it in a factual way that was also interesting. So kind of acquired that skill over the uh, over the years. I, I've had an ongoing story for an embarrassing long amount of time on um, – and that Eastport during World War II and, uh, you know, what was going on here at the Annapolis Yacht Yard and with the Schooner America. And you know, I've given a number of talks around town on that over the years. And, you know, this is like boiling the ocean. Like I've worked on this. It's 110,000 words right now. And, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling with it. So about a year ago, I said, you know, wouldn't it be easier just to pick a fixed thing like a lighthouse and just work on its timeline, you know, a fixed timeline, a fixed bit of earth and a fixed timeline. God, that'd be a lot easier than this boiling the ocean World War II project. So, so I dove in in earnest, you know, and, and I quickly discovered that, yeah, you are writing about one fixed bit of earth, a lighthouse, and on a very fixed linear timeline. Um, but the oyster wars come into play. The War of 1812 comes into play. The Civil War comes into play, you know, on and on. And uh, and the technology really jumped out at me that went into it. You know, we look at it now and think old, but there's a lot of technology that was built into it. So, you know, it, I, I started uh, kind of in earnest, I would say, in uh, mid-August of 2019. Sent out my uh, my query to the first publisher, uh, and the first publisher I contacted said yes, which also told me it was a little overdue. Wrote it um, through the fall. And did my research through the fall. Uh, you know, a year ago at this point, mm-hmm. I was down in the uh, in the archives. Filed it in early January, so I, it was due on January fifteenth, I think. And I turned it in early. I'll, I'll point out um, to my magazine friends. Uh, the third grade teacher will be proud my third of you. grade. My St. Mary's uh, <laughs> teachers will be proud of me. And um, you know, we were originally supposed to come out in July, but uh, because of COVID, they have kicked it out here till October. And uh, right. so we actually timed it to try to come out with the boat shows. And, uh, you know, here we are. You did do some research, didn't you? I'm assuming you did some research actually out on the structure itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't just uh, looking at old newspaper clippings and Coast Guard records, right? Yeah, you know, and that's what's, that to me, that's the back third of the book, right? The back third of the book is what's gone out there um, since 2004 when the Lighthouse came out of the government's hands into this consortium, public-private consortium's hands. Uh, now, who you know, is that public-private consortium? So the city of Annapolis is the lead partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, that This is who owns it right now. The city of Annapolis is the lead partner. The U.S. Lighthouse Society and its Chesapeake chapter. Okay. Uh, the Annapolis Maritime Museum. And Anne Arundel County. Those okay. are the four. Those are the four partners. Um, the U.S. Lighthouse Society is the operating part of that, and the uh, the City of Annapolis is actually the uh, long term lease holder. So what's going out, on out there since 2004 has been pretty extraordinary. And, and, and to your point earlier, it's really accelerated in the last two or three years. You know, they've raised over four hundred thousand dollars just in the last couple of years. I mentioned uh, John Potvin, uh, Henry Gonzalez. You know, there's been a number of um, Captain Howard Lewis, who took yep. you and I out there, right. uh, a number of, of individuals that have really leaned into this. And, um, you know, it looks amazing out there. Like, it's 
it's spectacular. So I, I, I really wanted to make sure the work, the preservation work that's going on now is featured. So the last probably third of the, uh, of the book is about what's happened since 2004. And to be honest with you, it put me in a great frame of mind knowing that, that this thing's going to be preserved for generations after we're gone, right? They've done right. an amazing job with it. It was here before us, and it'll be here after us. You know, it lasts. Well, I've been out there a couple times to watch the uh, the craftsmen, and, and they are true craftsmen. I mean, they're the Retired Woodworkers Guild, which I don't believe exists anymore. <laughs> but they're out there. I mean, you know, they're finding, you know, I, I think John was telling me about how he went and got a, a, a beam out of some barn in upstate New York to you know, fix the privy that was hanging out over. And it, the care that these guys have taken to do that. And, mm-hmm. and the big, the $400,000, that was because the steel underneath it. That's right. Had seen its time over hundreds of years. Yeah, that's right. And that, you know, a couple of points there. You know, that beam that John was mentioning, that that was one of the, the, the main beams on the main level. And it's made of, the one that they replaced with is made of yellow pine. And, you know, once you get the historic uh, designations that the lighthouse has, you know, it's on the National Register of Historic Places, but even more, um, you know, more uh, potently, it's on the national, it's a national historic landmark, right? There's only 12 lighthouses. That so are you're not there. running to Home Depot for a couple two-by-fours. No, two by you're, fours. Not, you're not throwing up a piece of, uh, you know, a piece of uh, plastic decking or something out there. The Maryland Historic Trust is keeping an eye on you. Uh, these different societies uh, that give you designations are keeping an eye on you. So you need to get it as close to original as you can, uh, or original, in this case, yellow pine. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so so you know, then the wood woodworkers are out there. The Annapolis Woodworking Guild. Um, you know, when you and I were out there, I think they were out there that day as well. Um, just an amazing, um, an amazing group of donating their time. Yeah, yeah. In your investigation, whether it be on land or out at sea on the on the lighthouse, what what surprised you about it? I mean, did anything? Yeah, you know, there were. That, that's a great question. There there were some great surprises um, when I went out there. You know, I knew that the keepers would have colorful stories, right? And, and I didn't want this to be an exhaustive biography of all the keepers, right? So I wanted to select a few colorful, colorful stories that that would jump out at me. So, you know, there were a couple keeper stories that uh, that, that really um, were meaningful to me. You know, and, and uh, the very first keeper of, of this of the lighthouse that we know out there, the Screw Pile Lighthouse had been wounded at Antietam on the Bloody Lane. So he was a young man, uh, a soldier from Delaware, and, uh, you know, fighting on behalf of the Union. And he was shot um, multiple times uh, in Antietam, right in the thick of the action, and was disabled for the rest of his life. And, you know, they often gave these choice lighthouse assignments to keepers that had been wounded in the Civil War. You know, they'd shown their um, wow. they'd shown their loyalty, they'd shown their dedication, they'd shown their valor. So uh, Eugene Birchinall was the first keeper. And, you know, as part of my research, I actually went to Antietam, um, to the Bloody Lane, and I figured out exactly where he and his group from Delaware were uh, were standing. And, you know, it was a quiet day. I was the only one there. Had a little moment with uh, with wow. Keeper Birch and all. It was pretty neat. Well, you, did you say that was a plum job? It was a plum assignment, yeah. So what was great about the Thomas Point assignment was, so in Birch and all's case, not a lot of stairs, right? This was not one of these towers like Cape Hatteras or Currituck right. where, where you're winding up stairs. So relatively easy to get around. Uh, Thomas Point was also interesting because it was only a few miles from Annapolis. And, and, you know, they could get in and out of Annapolis on the small boats that they kept there at the station. So there's some much more remote lighthouses on the Chesapeake Bay, especially down in the Southern Bay. Here you had, you know, the, the wonderful entertainment and supplies and activities of Annapolis close at hand. Uh, and, and it was, as I said, a technologically advanced, um, very high profile lighthouse. As we go on, I mean, you talked about the lightkeepers and it's really sort of changed in the way it operates. I mean, this was back in the day coming off of the Civil War. There's a guy probably with a lantern and, and, and a mirror and a candle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oil, really. It was, or oil, it was, right. Yeah. So it was uh, it was it was um, it was a lonely duty and it was it was fairly rote. Um, you know, first they cleaned everything. Right. Anybody that, that served out there in that era, you know, all they talk about is polishing brass and scrubbing the floors and repainting everything. So so much like being in, in the Navy, uh, you know, you're constantly cleaning and painting and scraping. Was um, that a mental thing? You know, no, the Lighthouse Board, the Lighthouse Board that, that, that ran the show after the Civil War, uh, you know, they had a little it was kind of a quasi military group. It was a um, you know, it was a, it was some Navy veterans and, and some people with experience and some Army veterans uh, who ran the show in D.C. And, and they demanded this sort of professionalism, um, you know, the cleanliness, the record keeping, the uh, the supply uh, store keeping, um, it was almost quasi military. And and then it, what, that was they said the lighthouse. The, that was the lighthouse board. So okay. you know, so so backing up a bit, um, 
the lighthouse system w was a little bit of a hot mess prior to the Civil War. I think everybody recognized that it was an important asset to the United States economy. You know, it was it was commercially very important to Baltimore that there be lighthouses going up and down the sure. light, up and down the bay. But it was always kind of mismanaged from from D.C. Uh, you know, never she really. Does a shock. Ne yeah, well, <laughs> never really lived in the proper. Um, never really lived in the proper place and, and, and D.C. And a lot of there was a lot of home cooking. The keepers tended to be locals who lived near the um, lived near the stations. You know, they were they were erratically lit. They were poorly constructed. The lights. You know, the systems and the technology lagged behind Europe. Um, after the Civil War, you know, as part of the recovery, they formed this new lighthouse board, and, and they got very serious about professionalizing the system. And it was during that time that the Thomas Point uh, Lighthouse was built out on the shoal. And at one point, the Coast Guard took over the Coast before, Guard, before the city. That's right. So, the, yes, the Coast Guard took over in 1938. So uh, the lighthouse board was disbanded. Uh, the Coast Guard was uh, was getting itself organized, and uh, and they became uh, 1938. And they manned it from 38 to 1986. So now, in was the that fall of 86. That wasn't still oil, was it, or was that— so you know it was carry it was it was there was oil on and off it was electrified uh, after World War II so there was actually an electric cable coming out from the mainland out to the lighthouse which is currently not working uh, but there was water um, brought out there and an electric cable brought out there so there's there's now running water in there so both of those um, the cables and the pipes are still there both of those have been completely shut off and and discontinued so so how does the lighthouse run now at this point. Um, so they were shut off and discontinued in 1986 when the uh, when the Coast Guard uh, automated it. And, and so today the lighthouse is powered by solar batteries. So uh, you know, there's solar panels on the, the southern end of it and on the eastern end of it up on that red. If you look close, you can see some solar panels uh, and they charge 12 volt batteries, which power the light. Uh, they also, in theory, power the fog horns and here your your listeners are going to be disappointed because I'm going to blow up one of the uh, common myths about Thomas Point is uh, the, the horns you hear in the fog when you're in Eastport or when you're out on the Annapolis Neck Peninsula are not the Stop, Thomas wait a minute, stop. You're going to tell us, like, this isn't Santa. Santa Claus isn't real, right? <laughs> I had somebody at one of my lectures almost in tears when I was telling him this because um, he said I would lay in bed at night and listen to Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse Foghorn and know it was out there. And I said, man, I love you. That's a great image. But um, the reality is that those are ships' foghorns. The light still shines on Thomas Point. The foghorn's been turned off for a few years. Uh, what happened was um, when you need the light and the foghorn at the same time on a foggy situation— right the batteries were draining very quickly and they had to prioritize the light over the foghorn. So, uh, so what you're actually hearing when you're out on the Annapolis Neck Peninsula or here in Eastport is uh, ships foghorns that are anchored out there near Thomas Point. That are warning other ships warning that other they, ships, hey, we're here. As required by the, uh, by the rules of navigation, exactly. Interesting, interesting. So sorry to bust that bubble there. Well, but, uh, yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. Well, I tell you, the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse does have tours and the Annapolis Maritime Museum runs them Every summer, uh, except for the past one, and hopefully they're going to do it again. But it's they go out twice on Saturdays, mm -hmm. and I've done them a couple different times. And I will have to say it's it's a small tour. It's eighteen passengers. You get to, I mean you get to climb from the dock, and there's probably a fancier name for that part of a lighthouse, but mm -hmm. the the landing. Just go with the landing. That's uh, great. You know, up up the ladders, up the steps. You're ducking. You're the the twisty curvy steps. You get up into the actual light. You can see how they lived. Um, and the neat thing that the Preservation Society has done is they've taken some rooms and they put them into Coast Guard time. And another room might be in the Lighthouse Board time. Mm -hmm. So you can really sort of see the progression of time through the Lighthouse. Yeah. You know, John, what's amazed me about it, th those tours are, are remarkable. And, you know, hopefully they'll resume again in 2021 and, mm -hmm. and folks can get out there. Uh, you know, the number of people, and, and I encountered this um, and it was a little intimidating at first, to be honest. Uh, the number of people that, that love and are devoted to that lighthouse is, is remarkable. And, and there's a group of docents uh, you know, here uh, based through the Maritime Museum that are trained to give the, uh, the tours and the lectures out there. And, and you know, what a group of incredibly devoted, well-educated, articulate people on the subject of the lighthouse. You know, you know, they, they are, uh, they're a lar large part of it. John Potvin... And Captain Howard, Henry Gonzalez, the um, the Woodworking Guild, and the other volunteers out there—it's just amazing. A lot of people love this this lighthouse, and it, and it's and it's been feeling the love and 
you're right. It's it, it looks incredible inside. It looks beautiful. It re- it really does. And that tour actually is when you see the price on it. A lot of people go like, eee! but I'm like, okay, it is. A, first of all, it's a three hour tour. Okay, so it's it's a long tour. You've got a boat ride from the Maritime Museum out there and back. But it is the most worthwhile tour that I've that I've ever taken. I mean, you don't have many of these left anymore. And these are the ones that are, you know, you can get in, you can climb on it, you can actually see this history and feel it from, you know, the 1800s. Yeah, I mean, uh, here's the thing. Uh, you can't help but feel it when you're out there, you know. It, it, and some of these stories that I that I talk about in the book, um, the, the people that have served out there and the, and the people that have worked on the thing, you know, there's something very meaningful about being in the place. You know, there's something very meaningful about, about being there, Standing there, walking on those same steps, looking out at the same uh, the same views that those that went before us did, um, and then the lighthouse itself, the the amount of it that's um, that's original and uh, that's still there it, it is just a bit breathtaking. You know, when John Potvin and his crew were uh, doing some preservation work, they actually found. Um, some markings on on some of the parts of the lighthouse that were part of the original kit from when it was put together in 1875. So some of those markings, those part numbers, were still on some of the uh, the material in there. So you know it, it can be very moving if you put yourself in the right in the right mindset, and it's not very hard to get in that mindset. You know to 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 stand in that place and and to look out on those views and and, and to be part of that physical form. Um, it, it's worth every cent and then some. The tickets are eighty five dollars, and it's well worth it. It's probably well worth it at one hundred and eighty five dollars, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. And I, I don't say that lightly at all. And I think I think you'll agree with me there. Absolutely. But let's get into the important part here. Okay, you wrote a book. We need to sell copies of the books, and people need to read the book and learn a little bit more about the history. It's much more than a paragraph in a great picture book. It's much more than a chapter in a greater history of the Chesapeake Bay. This is, I don't know what. 3,500 square feet, two miles offshore, and that's that's sort of where it's centered. Yeah, yeah. So the book is um, the book has about 60 illustrations in it. Um, some of the plans, some uh, some drawings, a bunch of photos, historic photos, contemporary photos, um, and then it's about 60,000 words. Uh, you know, it covers the history of the shoal and the point and the two um, lighthouses that were there before. Uh, it covers the planning and the building of the current lighthouse. Uh, big section on the keepers and their adventures out there, and then uh, as I mentioned earlier, a section towards the end on um, on the current preservation efforts. And just for fun, and because this is the Chesapeake Bay, there's a chapter on fishing at the lighthouse as well. So I uh, I went out uh, with Tom Weaver, who's an Eastport yep. captain, and uh, Tom and I went fishing, and he passed along a few secrets. And then Lenny Rudow, uh, another uh, well known local fisherman, um, also spent some time with me talking about Thomas Point. So uh, so there's a section on fishing. So um, the book's available on October 12th. Uh, it's twenty one ninety nine. Uh, I've said since the beginning that I'll uh, donate a percentage of my uh, my proceeds back to the lighthouse preservation effort, and oh, uh, and that's on track. So every every dollar I earn from this thing, some of it'll go back to the lighthouse uh, preservation efforts. Um, you can find it uh, directly from the publisher. It's called the History Press out of uh, Charleston. Uh, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and, and those places. And then it's going to start being available here in town on uh, on October the uh, on October the twelfth. And I don't yet have the list of everywhere that's going to have it in hand. Um, but I, I I know it's going to be in a number of spots. We've been working to get it into uh, the museum here and faucets and the boatyard and the bookshops uh, downtown, um, et cetera. Right. I think Back Creek Books and. And the Back old Creek box books. bookstore would, on Maryland Avenue would do it, and when the Maritime Museum opens up, certainly it's, yeah. a, it's a natural for that. You know, John, I'm a, I'm a, I, I worked on this. You know, I did, I did two startups here in Annapolis. Um, you know, so I'm all about the, uh, you know, the, the home cooking. So if you can buy it from somebody local here, and and you can buy it from a shop here, um, you know, I, I'm all for that, and uh, you know, I'd love to do that. And you can chase me down. I'll be happy to sign a copy if that's what you'd like. Um, I'd be happy to happy to do that and, and you know support some local businesses. So now, are you, are you I, typically with a book book launch? Uh, you'd be having parties and drinking beer at the boatyard, or you know, yeah. and, and signing everything else. Yeah, do, a little do, bit. Are there any events that a are a little bit of a uh, tough one there? Um, you know, I was hopeful that that this we launched time to launch around the boat shows and you know around the 25th anniversary of Spin Sheet and the 15th anniversary of Prop Talk. So this was supposed to be party season, right? You, like you and yeah. I would have seen each other. Uh, a couple times a week uh, with all of our friends at these things, but uh, you know now in this in this current environment there will be some events. Um, I've already done a few virtual events, uh, you know, on, on Zoom and, and that sort of thing, and on Facebook Live. I'm hopeful there'll be some some uh, in person events. You know, we we I, I'm 
want to be you know incredibly careful and, and respectful and as do the business owners here uh, I'm talking to a few different businesses about uh, about doing some sort of a launch event um, I'm scheduled to speak here at the Maritime Museum in early uh, January on the topic of of Thomas Point Shoal it's a little unclear yet you know what format that'll be but um, you know I've got that one on the books and and I would say you know I'll, I'll keep you and you know your channels uh, informed of any events and I'd love uh, your help getting the word out well I was gonna say I mean I try to keep my eye on some of these things so but I mean where, is there a place where people can go to follow up I mean to keep up with you yeah, so, um, yeah, there's a couple spots. Um, you know, the Spin Sheet guys do a really nice job of, uh, of, of promoting things. And, you know, I'm, I'm around the waterfront and around the water. And I'm so, uh, you know, I'm so honored that they still do that. Um, on Twitter, I'm D Gendel, D-G-E-N-D-E-L-L. That's my, uh, that's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm probably a little bit more active, believe it or not, on, uh, on Instagram. I'm a big uh, power user on Instagram. It's just David Gendel okay. on Instagram. And, and you know, the, you'll find a lot of Lighthouse photos on, uh, on my Instagram feed. <laughs> I am sure. I will say, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's a boring title, but it tells it exactly what it is. And the Thomas Point Show is, is an icon. Well, you know, I'm a big believer on name it what it is, <laughs> right? My working name for Spin Sheet was Chesapeake Bay Sailing. You know, and uh, <laughs> some people came in, and uh, we, we had a, we had a naming meeting, an emergency naming meeting, uh, when I was naming everything Chesapeake Bay Sailing. So when it was time to name this thing, you know, uh, I, I name it what it is. I, I'm a believer in that. So Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse is what we went with. The publisher was happy with it, so that's what we got. And there's no surprises when you get into it. That's it's, right. It's that's about right. the Thomas Point Shoal Light. <laughs> hey, question for you: Is the thing haunted? So is the thing haunted? That's a good question. Um, you know, people love those ghost stories, right? Our friend Mike Carter downtown. Can we make one up? Great job. <laughs> no, well, a keeper disappeared in the early 20th century. A young keeper, um, assistant keeper, actually disappeared out there. The, uh, the head keeper went into Annapolis for supplies, and when he came back, it was empty, uh, and, and his assistant was gone. And, uh, you know, they looked at some of his papers and his letters, and, and you know, they don't really ne- they never really found out what happened to this guy. Uh, the Baltimore papers picked it up. And, um, you know, leapt, uh, he was uh, loneliness drove him to his death was the uh, was the headline oh in the Baltimore Sun. I've got a chapter in there on the missing keeper. So if it was haunted, that may be the guy, Henry Attucks. Um, that may be the guy that haunts it. But uh, I've yet to spend the night out there. No electricity, no running mm-hmm. water. 1875. I can't wait to get out there and spend the night on that. I, I, I was going to say, man, that's going to bring you right back to a couple hundred years ago. You just got to make sure you have the right people with you is my thought. Yeah, you that's know, for, that's that for could sure. go bad pretty quick, like The <laughs> Shining or something. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thomas Point Show Lighthouse, a Chesapeake Bay icon, is available now uh, for pre-shipping on Amazon. Um, but I do recommend that you don't do that and get out, walk around, visit some local businesses and find them if they're maritime related. They probably will. A good that's chance right. they'll probably have it. That's right. Uh, I know you threw out faucets. You threw out the boatyard, the Maritime Museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, spin sheet prop talk. I mean, I'm sure you could probably go up yep. to their office. They yep. still give you a key to that place. And, well, uh, <laughs> if I have one, I haven't used it in, uh, in 10 plus years. Uh, they're very nice to me. Let's just say that. Fantastic. Dave Gandell, thank you very much for your time. Congratulations on the book. And actually stay tuned here because we're going to figure out a way to give away this copy that you gave us and you might be able to get it before anybody else. All right. And great. it's signed. That might be worth something someday. He well, could be the, he could be the next JR, uh, What's her name? Not J.R. J.K. 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 Rowling. Well, wait, till my, uh, wait till my World War II Annapolis book gets done, then, uh, then we'll see what happens. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. This has been an update from Ion Annapolis. Please visit us at ionannapolis.net. Follow us on Facebook at All Annapolis and on Twitter at Ion Annapolis. And if you haven't subscribed to the Daily News Brief podcast, go for it. And all of your local news will be delivered to your phone, tablet, or smart device by 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday.